The reason I'm telling you all of this is nowadays we hear a lot of uh, people say, oh, you have to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. And what they mean by Sunnah is Google whether there's a Hadith or not. Right? That's not Sunnah. That's a Hadith. And to understand how that Hadith was applied so that you understand the Sunnah is the next step. You can't just look at a Hadith and say, now I know exactly what to do. You understand? So, before we talk about the change in sequence, before we talk about the change in sequence with Ibrahim there's two more things I wanted to talk to you about in regards to the book and the wisdom that I didn't talk about in the last session. So, I'm going to quickly mention them now. One way you can look at wisdom is actually the way Allah describes wisdom in different places in the Quran. If you take a look at that, you'll see that there's a difference between what you can call laws and on the other side, morals. Laws and morals or morality, ethics even. Another word for that can be ethics. And the difference is important to understand. A law is something that's very precise. Okay, like fasting begins at this time, ends at this time. That's a law. The salahs are at kitab al mawquta That's a law. It's specific. In inheritance, who, which family member gets, gets how much is a law. So laws are very specific. Another distinguishing factor with some laws is that laws, when you break them, are punishable. So there are laws that include punishments too. Right? Laws, not every law has punishments, but some laws can also have punishments, right? Um, another important factor about laws you should know is laws deal with extremes. This is also important in any society, laws deal with extremes. Like most laws that are written in the books are not written for normal people. They're written for criminals, right? Because the, the law of, you know, like controlling your speed on the highway or the laws against stealing or the laws against robbery or the laws against murder or the laws against those kinds of kidnapping and those kinds of things, those laws are not written for normal people. They're written for the most extreme criminal elements of society. So you'll find in the Quran, the laws of the Quran, of course, deal with all of this. They deal with specifics, they also deal with, um, you know, uh, uh, punishments in some cases. And then they also deal with very extreme situations. So just because you see a law in the Quran doesn't mean that that's meant for everyone. It's meant for very, very extreme situations. The craziest members of society need to have some laws on the book because you never know what human beings are capable of. You understand? So Allah will say something that's obvious. It's a crude example, but an important example. Allah says, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُكُمْ وَخَلَاتُكُمْ وَعَمَّاتُكُمْ Like, it's haram for you to marry your mothers and your aunts and your daughters and your, you know, Allah says that. But obviously, it's obvious for the vast majority of humanity, but some psychos are out there that need to be punished if they have some sickness like that. You understand? So the laws have to be there to prevent those kinds of extremes and to actually be able to punish those kinds of extremes if they happen. Anyway, so that's a little bit about laws. But let's talk about wisdom. And I said this time wisdom, you can look at it as morality, right? So an example of wisdom in the Quran is وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا Walk on the earth with humility. Don't walk on the earth with pride. How do you know if somebody's walking on the earth with pride or walking on the earth with humility? You can't have some Islamic police check, hey, fix your, humble your walk. No, no, I'm not, I'm not walking with swag. I have a swollen foot. That's why I'm walking like this. <laughs> That's not my gangster walk. That's just, you know, I have an injury. Right? You can't check if somebody's walking with pride. That's so one of the, the first things you should know about morality is you cannot immediately catch someone doing it. Or it's it's pretty much never punishable. You could obey the law and still be very immoral. You could be a very unethical person. Allah says, for example, you know, uh, don't raise your voice. In Surah Al-Muqban, with a passage on wisdom, Allah says, you know, um, Lower your voice. The, the ugliest voice is the braying of a donkey. The sounds made by a donkey or a mule. Right? So, but does, does that mean that if you raise your voice, you've done something haram? No, you've done something unethical, unwise, but you haven't necessarily done something Haram. So now we're learning that as far as our behavior is concerned, Allah expects us to act within the law and also Allah expects us to act wisely. The problem happens when a lot of people think all Islam is is halal and haram. Halal and haram is about the law, but it's not about what? Wisdom. 
So the only question is, is this halal? Is this haram? Is this halal? Is this haram? Okay, it's not halal, then it's okay. No, 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 no. Halal, it may be halal, but it also at the same time may not be what? May not be wise. May not even be moral. That's the other side you got to check. Right? So that's that's another another dimension of it. Like I, it's a silly example, but like, uh, is it halal to eat peanuts? Yeah. But is it wise for you to eat peanuts if you have a peanut allergy? Probably not. <laughs> You understand? So there, there is a distinction between morality and law. So that's one quick thing. The other quick uh, comment in regards to this is about hadith. Because, you know, uh, Imam Shafi'i said that hikmah can refer to the sunnah of the Prophet So I wanted to make a quick comment about um, uh, humility in understanding hadith. So the thing is, and this analogy will help you, if you look inside a door from a keyhole, like a small hole in the door, and you look inside, how much of the room do you see? Very little. But if somebody looks inside the room and sees this much and then says, now I will describe the entire room to you. Is that a fair, accurate depiction? Or do you have to use a lot of imagination? In a lot of imagination. Okay, now let, let me ask you another question. If two people are talking about, like, let's say me and some other young man are talking. And he says, I have a problem with my brother. You know, he, he's, he's this, he's that, the other, he's, he, you know, he beats me up or whatever. I'm talking to him. I say, you know what? Sometimes you should fight back a little bit or something. And you walk by and you heard three seconds of that conversation. Okay? You don't know the beginning of it. You don't know the end of it. You know the middle three seconds. Is it accurate for you to take the conver the three second conversation and then say, you know, inspired by Ustad Nawaz, I think anytime you meet your brother, you should beat him up because, and I have an authentic recording of him saying, fight back, with your brother to throw a punch or two. Would that be fair of you to do? No, because you're not being, first of all, you're not recognizing that conversations happen sometimes inside a context. And outside of that context, you cannot use them. A doctor and a patient are having a conversation. The doctor says, you need to eat this, this, this. And you need to, you need to avoid this, this, and this. Is that specific to the patient? Yeah, but the patient is an influencer. So he goes after the doctor patient appointment. He says, everyone, stop eating this, this, this. And make sure you take this medication every morning. This is authentically researched, based research. Wait, hold on a second. You can't tell everyone to do that because that was specific prescription for who? For you. You understand? Now let's understand what happens in many a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ is talking to all of the Muslims. Which means everybody's being addressed. Sometimes a specific person comes to the Prophet ﷺ and says, I need help. Help me with this situation or that situation. And you'll find many a hadith where a person comes to the Prophet ﷺ and talks to him. And the Prophet gives him an answer. It's also interesting to note that different people come and say, one of the genres of hadith is, someone comes and says, what's the best thing that I can do? Right? And another person says the same question, what's the best thing that I can do? Another person says, what's the best thing that I can do? And you'll find in these different hadith narrations, there are different answers. Is that the same answer? If that one person who was told, this is the best thing you can do, goes on, by the way guys, the best thing you all can do is this. And the other guy says, what do you mean? No, no, no. The best thing you can do is what the Prophet told me. And the other one comes and says, no, 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 no. You guys are both wrong. The best thing you can do is what the Prophet told me. Guys, sorry for the interruption in the middle of this lecture. Just before you continue, I want to let you know and encourage you that I want you to sign up for BayanaTV.com and help others sign up or even sponsor students for BayanaTV.com so we can create worldwide communities of students that are studying the meanings and the benefit and the wisdom of the Qur'an uh, and are inshallah ta'ala spreading that in their own circles. Thanks so much. What do you think is happening when people come to the Prophet as opposed to when the Prophet is talking to everyone? Is there a difference? Because when the Prophet is talking to someone who came to him, he, it is because he's the source of wisdom in, in the humanity, he's first looking at who am I talking to? What is their situation? What is their background? What is it that this person needs? I'm going to give them a prescription for them. They need this. It is important for us to first understand, is the Prophet saying something, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that is meant for everyone? Or was that specific to a person? Isn't that important? Now, there's, there's another piece of the puzzle. The analogy I gave you is this much, yes? There's a conversation happening and the Prophet ﷺ says something. 
and you're like, oh, there's a hadith. He said this. I was like, is this part of a larger conversation? Who was this conversation being had with? Did he have this conversation with other people? Do we know the whole picture or do we know this much? If you read that hadith of the Prophet it might take you three seconds to read the entire hadith. Do you think the conversation was just three seconds? Could the conversation have been five minutes? Could it have been ten minutes? Could it have been over multiple days? Is that possible? Is there a lot we don't know? Yeah. So some, And this is where just googling, oh, I found a hadith it's in Bukhari and in Muslim, or it's in Abu, Maj- you know, Abu Dawood, or Ibn Majah, and therefore that we should do all, we should all do this. Hold on a second. You're thinking that the moment you find the letter, you moment, the moment you find the letter, you've got it figured out. The Muslims historically never did this. This is a new phenomenon in the last century. For the religion's been around a long time, and nobody simply just took a hadith and said, This is what we're all gonna do. Nobody was doing this. But because we have now it's the age of information, we have access to the glimpse of the conversation of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the difference between the hadith narration and the faqih. What does the faqih do? The faqih says, the Prophet said this, والسلام, but let's find out who he said it to. Let's find out when he said it. Let's find out where he said it. Let's understand the, the larger context because without it, we might come to the wrong conclusion. Is that possible? Yeah, it's very possible. It's very possible you might come to the wrong conclusion. It's also very possible that he was dealing with a very specific case and you pretend that you're dealing with, this is about everyone. The reason I'm telling you all of this is nowadays we hear a lot of uh, people say, oh, you have to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. And what they mean by Sunnah is Google whether there's a Hadith or not. Right? That's not Sunnah. That's a Hadith. And to understand how that Hadith was applied so that you understand the Sunnah is the next step. You can't just look at a hadith and say, now I know exactly what to do. You understand? And there are other issues too. Like if the Prophet ﷺ says something, then of course the Sahaba are the ones that are listening. And if they, like I'll give you a silly example, even though I'm not a fiqh person, but I I discuss fiqh with scholars and colleagues and things. The Rasul ﷺ says, grow the beard. He says, grow the beard. Okay, fine, grow the beard. That's what the Rasul said. I saw the How much should I grow it? When should I cut it? How much should I cut the, the mustache? What's the length of it? These, these are technical questions, right? Well, one way you can go about it is you could say, I found one Sahabi who had this much beard. Or I found one. But then you might take Imam Malik's approach. He says, let's look at how people in Medina have their beards because they're the people that lived inspired by the Prophet so them in the first generation. Or even Abu Hadifa might say there are hundreds of Sahaba that live in Kufa. Because Ali radiallahu anhu made the capital of, of uh, Islam, Kufa, in Baghdad, right? And there's hundreds of companions that live there. Let's look at their beards before we decide to set a rule on how long beards should be. That's pretty logical because the Sahaba wouldn't be disobeying the Messenger, sallallahu But if you don't know that background, because this is the fuqaha discussing it, you don't know that background, you just say, hey, there's a hadith, it says grow. It didn't say stop growing. So keep on going, bro. Just keep on growing. And cut. It didn't say when to stop cutting, so you keep on cutting. Right? That's a, to me, that's a problem. To me, that's an issue. Because it's not just about citing, oh, where'd you get the, where's your Daniel, brother? The Daniel bros? Okay? But the, the thing with the, the, the Daniel approach is we're not looking at the actual context, which is, هذا يخالف الحكمة. This is, this is against wisdom. And this is wisdom that the early Muslims had. And this is something that you should become more humble to. Like when somebody cites, a, when somebody tells me a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, my first reaction is, I don't know yet. That's honestly my first reaction. I need to know more. Where did this come from? How was this understood? What other you know, narrations are around this? What is the background to this? Who are the people involved? Let me get a little bit more than this before I say I know. Because knowing this much and claiming this much is arrogance in my opinion. That's just my personal. That's my personal take on what is what goes against wisdom. Rasul Sallallahu was taught the law, and he was taught the wisdom. Now let's answer this question about Ibrahim Alayhi Salam. Thousands of years ago, Ibrahim Alayhi Salam asked the question. He made du'a to Allah. This wise du'a: Send a messenger among my children for, through Ismail, a messenger. And thousands of years later, from the line of Ismail Alayhi Salam comes Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. On the other side, Ibrahim Alayhi Salam had Ishaq. Ishaq is a prophet. Alayhi Salam. Ishaq gives birth, in his family there's Yaqub, who's a prophet. 
Yaqub has a child named Yusuf, who's a prophet. And Rasulullah tells us, Kullama halaka nabiyun khalafa nabiyun. Every time a prophet died, another one took their place among the Israelites. So their side, the Ishaq part of Ibrahim's family, prophet, 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 prophet every time. Until Jesus. Until Isa. And even when Isa was there, another prophet was there with him, Yahya. So they were there together. They were two at the same time. Or even Musa wasn't alone. Musa was with who? Harun alayhi salam. And there were other, you know, if, if they were from the Israelites, the, men, the ones mentioned in Yasin, there were three messengers at the same time. Fa'azaz nabi thalithin. Even three messengers at the same time. So that happened. Now, on the Ismail side, Allah says, based, the Ibrahim alayhi salam asked for how many messengers? Rabbana wab'athihim. Rasul, one messenger. So Ismail, thousands of years. And then, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But from the line of Ishaq, when Musa alayhi salam was given the book, I read the passage to you from Surah Al-A'raf, Allah told Musa alayhi salam and the 70 leaders, look out for al-Nabi al-Ummi. Nabi al-Nabi al-Ummi. And, they, and this is important in Surah Al-Baqarah. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says that Ibrahim alayhi salam gathered all of his children. Uh, Yaqub alayhi salam gathered all of his children. By the way, another name of Yaqub is Israel. This is really important. Another name of Yaqub is what? Israel. So when he gathered his children, these were the children of Israel, literally. But Israel, the children of Israel. When he was dying, he said, Who will you worship? And what will you worship after I'm gone? La ta'buduna min ba'di. Surah Al Baqarah. Here's what they said Na'budu ilahaka wa ilaha abaika Ibrahima wa Ismaila wa Ishaqa. We will worship your God and the God of your, of your fathers, Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq. Who did they acknowledge as one of their fathers? Ismail. Ismail. Later Israelites dismiss Ismail. He's from the cursed line. He's not really a son and all of that. But when, ya, when Israel himself, alayhi salam, was dying and he asked them, what will you worship after I'm gone? They referred to Ismail before they even referred to Ishaq because he's their older uncle. He's older than their dad. So they went in age order, Ibrahim, Ismail, and then Ishaq. And from the line of Ismail eventually comes Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is why the Quran says they know, they know him like they know their own children. They know him like they know their own children. And they know the Kaaba like they know their own children. Because if you, how can you know Ibrahim alayhi salam and not know the Kaaba? How does that make any sense? And Ismail alayhi salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam built the Kaaba and after that Ishaq is born. Ishaq is younger. He's born afterwards. How is Ishaq being raised by Ibrahim alayhi salam not learning about the Kaaba? Does that make any sense? The house that Allah made him build after passing all the tests and Ishaq doesn't know about the Kaaba? That makes no sense. So they know. Now this dua that he was making, he said to Allah, Ya Allah, these children, my child is a prophet. And my other child is, the, Allah has promised him prophecy on that side. So he's assuming that his children are going to be pure. All they need is, when they hear the ayat of Allah, they'll be ready to act on them. The moment they get exposed to the ayat of Allah, because who, who is Ibrahim alayhi salam? If qala lahu rabbuhu aslim, qala aslam tu. Whenever Allah said to him, surrender, what did he do? He surrendered immediately. And what did he learn from his child? He told his child, Inni araf al manami anni adbahuka. I, I see in my dream that I'm slaughtering you. What did his son say? Hold on, dad. What did his son say? Ifa'al ma tawbar. Ya abit ifa'al ma tawbar. Dad, do whatever you're being told. He's exactly like his dad. Whenever he hears the word of Allah, he immediately what? Obeys it. So in his mind, when you hear the ayat of Allah, then you're ready to learn what Allah tells you to do and you'll do it. Yu'allimuhum al kitaba wal Hikmah. And yes, over time, we should make sure that we remain cleansed. Cleansing was not a prerequisite for obedience in his experience. Because he's, he's got these pure kids. He's got himself, he's pure of heart, and his child is pure of heart. So he makes the dua from the, the best way he could think from the human perspective. Allah answered his dua. But Allah answered his dua by perfecting his dua. The human being asks to the best of their ability and Allah takes his, he takes every element of his prayer and answers it, but perfects it. He says, Don't you asked for the right things, but I'm going to give you the right order of things that only Allah could have known. And which is, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِنَا وَيُزَكِّيكُمْ 
وَيُعَدِّمُكُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ All of these ayat connect with the ayah we're studying. For example, Al-Aziz Al-Hakim in Surah Al-Baqarah connects with Surah Al-Jumu'ah, doesn't it? And then in the next ayah, Allah says, وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ in the second ayah, in ayah 151, He ends the ayah by saying, وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ He teaches you what you couldn't have known. Well, you couldn't have known because you were ummiyin. And ummiyin is mentioned where? In Surah Al-Jumu'ah. This is connecting to that too. And then in the, la- in the last one, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah has done a huge favor to the believers when He appointed a messenger among them. So in Ali Imran, he, before he mentions these four steps, he mentions that Allah has done them a huge favor. Guess what's coming in the next ayah? Two ayahs later in Surah Al-Jumu'ah. ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ That is the favor of Allah. He gives it to whoever He wants. So Ali Imran, Baqarah 151, Baqarah 129, all tie into Surah Al-Jumu'ah in one way or the other. The ayah that we're, we're learning from. And so we conclude this with, وَإِن كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْنُوا لَفِي ضَلَادٍ مُبِينَ Even though they had been clearly, clearly lost. Now, Allah is going to now, uh, in, the, in the next ayah, open up the future plan of the Ummah. And that's what we're, I'm really excited to discuss with you guys tomorrow. Inshallah, we'll, not only will we finish the first section of the surah tomorrow, we're also going to start section 2 tomorrow. So I'm going to give you an overview of the first section which is the first four ayat of the surah. Two are done today, two will be done tomorrow, inshallah. And then we will uh, get an overview and begin the, 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 the parable portion of the surah. So that's my dars for the day. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim. Wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bin ayati wa bikil hakim. Assalamu alaikum everyone. There are almost 50,000 students around the world that are interested on top of the students we have in studying the Qur'an and its meanings and being able to learn that and share that with family and friends. And they need sponsorships, which is not very expensive. So if you can help sponsor students on Bayina TV, please do so and visit our sponsorship page. I appreciate it so much. And pray that Allah gives our mission success and we're able to share the meanings of the Qur'an and the beauty of it the world over.